Um, all right, so we're going to get started. This is uh, PowerShell for the reluctant or recalcitrant DBA developer. Um, this material is all kind of snagged from another session that I do that's at uh, SQL Saturdays that's more geared towards intro PowerShell people, so not advanced level. So some of these, the demos might be a little rudimentary, so, um, but definitely we can, we can drill into stuff if you guys have specific questions. Here's the abstract, which I'm assuming you guys read that, and that's why you're here. Um, this is me, I'm Jason Horner. I uh, have a lot of certifications. I'm an MVP in SQL Server, not in PowerShell. Um, I'm from Littleton, Colorado. This is my satellite image of my house in Littleton, Colorado. Uh, this is one of our farm, family farm in Minnesota. I worked at, the reason this is relevant is I worked at a company called uh, Digital Globe prior to joining Pragmatic Works, where I'm currently at. Uh, we captured satellite imagery um, with our satellites and sold it for commercial and government purposes. So I just kind of always put that in there. I do a, I speak probably about 18 events a year, uh, mainly on SQL Server, uh, geospatial data, uh, data warehousing, and uh, PowerShell. Occasionally, I'm starting to get get back into talking more about PowerShell. Uh, surprisingly enough, I've been talking about PowerShell since I think about 2007, so a while. Um, I started working with it back when it was Monad, uh, Monad, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so, fair amount of experience. Definitely make it interactive. Ask me questions. Did you do it? Could you do anything with it with Monad? Well, not with SQL Server out of the box, right? But yeah, that was that was a long time ago, man. Yeah, the times. There were a few commandlets, not as many as we have today, right? So, anyway, this is the module where I really get into SQL Server, so we don't cover a lot of the intro to PowerShell because I assume that you guys all. Everybody here is that feels like they're at a proficient level of PowerShell, hopefully. Okay, if you don't, or if you see stuff in the script, stop me. Or if you see stuff, more importantly, if you see stuff in my script that I'm doing wrong, tell me about that, because I'll fix it. Because I always like to hear how other people do stuff. So, oh, we're full, guys, sorry. Oh, Fire code, sorry. You can't. <laughs> He's right. messing with you. Yeah, all right. So, um, SQL Server and PowerShell. So, first of all, you need to kind of understand what's supported here. So all of these versions, I'm assuming everyone in here works with SQL Server at some level. Does anybody have anything pre-2000? No. 2000? No. Where we start out at? 28? At 28s? Yeah. 2012? 05? Okay. So, yeah, um, 05 SP2+. Plus. Um, there's some OS requirements, but that's more PowerShell related to, in general, you want to be um, at a baseline Windows Server 2008. I'd, I'd recommend going to 2012, uh, 2012 R2. Um, hopefully, I don't know if they're going to backport. Does anybody know if they're going to backport 5 to the down level OSs? 5 is already currently available for 2012. Uh -huh. And um, I believe they've said they want to try to do 2008 R2, but they haven't been able to get there yet. Yeah. So. It's going to be good stuff. I haven't, I haven't messed with it much yet. Um, uh, 2012 is really where they start adding a lot of new commandlets uh, in Power, uh, PowerShell for SQL Server. And 2014, they've, they've added some around um, high availability. So we'll take a look at those. Um, so there's a couple different ways that you can execute PowerShell. It's just some kind of basic stuff. So the first is you can always run it from, run it from PowerShell, right? Import module, SQL PS is one of the modules. There's another one for analysis services, um, SQL AS. Um, some of the older versions can require some more setup. Uh, you might want to import the SMO libraries directly. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, you can run it from SQL Agent. There's actually a PowerShell subsystem. So uh, if we see right there, when I, this is the part of the GUI from the SQL Server Agent job. I can create a PowerShell job step and set it up there. What I find a lot of people do is they'll just run command exec and run PowerShell.exe manually. Uh, with PowerShell, I believe it still kicks off this SQL PS mini shell, which is a total POS, uh, which I don't recommend using that. That also kicks off if I right click any of this is Management Studio. Anytime I right click in here, I can always click this start PowerShell. Um, the problem is, is, aside from each instance uses 40 megs, it's kind, of, it's kind of boxed in. It's not the full PowerShell experience. So it's, you're better off, and this wasn't always an option, um, I think. This was 2012 where they actually added this as a module. Before, you could either add the snap in manually or you could manually load the DLLs yourself. Um, there's some kind of obnoxious behavior when you import this module. It actually s sets you to the SQL Server PS drive, which I don't like. But anyway, these are, these are your main options. Um, yeah. 
So SQL Server and PowerShell, so how do, how do you get the capabilities, uh, use it against SQL Server? You've got commandlets, um, so there's about 45 uh, commandlets in the 2014 shipping version with SQL Server. Uh, it also ships with a PS provider. Does everybody know what a PS provider is? No? Okay, so a PS provider is basically, um, it's a, it's a plug-in infrastructure to PowerShell that allows you to treat resources like a file system, right? So it's hierarchical access. There's a PS provider built in for the registry, file system, obviously, uh, variables, uh, environment, and then SQL Server has its own. So it's pretty cool. So I can go in there, and just like I'm in SSMS, I can navigate through my SQL servers. I can connect to remote SQL servers from, from the same machine, too. A little bit uh, dicey in certain environments where they've locked uh, down ports and stuff, and they've, uh, I think it goes through a little bit of WMI and then I think DCOM as well. And you get that when you import the S. Yeah, oh, and we'll yeah. we'll show that when we get to the when we get to the demos. Um, good question. So the, the question is, is how do you get the PS provider? And, and the answer is when you import the module, it uh, changes your context to the it creates a SQL Server drive basically. Um, okay, then there's command line utilities. So these are often overlooked. It's a set of the utilities. They come with SQL Server. And PowerShell is a great Google language, right? So you don't always need to have a command line. So one of the things you can do is you can script, use PowerShell to script some of these utilities uh, to get done what, what you need to get done. What I see typically is people run the setup.exe uh, and wrap PowerShell around that. It's kind of, I think that's still, I think there's DSC resources now for, for SQL Server setup. I know Jason Morgan built one. I don't know if he published it to the GitHub or not, but I, I know a couple other people have built them too. Yeah, there's some stuff floating out there. I've met. So, some have to look at yeah, so the, you know, a lot of times what I see people do is they'll just it's a, it supports an INI file, right, with a bunch of parameters. So it's really easy to automate that with uh, PowerShell. Um, the other thing, there's a, a utility that ships, ships as part of replication called um, TableDiff.exe, and it basically can go in and you can point it to Table A and Server A and Database A, and point it to Table B and Database B. And, table uh, B and it'll tell you are they the same or are they different or not and what the utility is made for is to troubleshoot replication top topologies to see if the tables are synced I use it a lot of time to check the difference between dev and prod when I have the same tables to see if they're there uh, there's a couple other utilities we'll talk more about those later does, does that compare to schema or does it compare to data it, it, it does it does both so and you you can kind of you can give it some advanced switches to do some stuff on there uh, it's very fast even for larger tables I found um, so it's, it's a pretty good tool to have in your back pocket, for sure. Uh, the question was, does it do data or schema? And the answer is it does both, depending on how you put the um, command line options in. So then you have SMO, or server, ma server management objects. Uh, it's a .NET SQL Server Management API. Everything that SQL uh, Management uh, Studio does is basically going to go through SMO to SQL Server. So the point of me calling that out explicitly is that um, Anything that I can do from Management Studio, I can do from SMO. And so when you need to start doing things onesie twosies, it's probably okay to use Management Studio. When you need to do things at scale or multiple times, or you just want to make it repeatable and consistent, then you can fall back to SMO. Um, WMI is kind of an interesting thing. I, not a lot of people know this, but there's two WMI, uh, I'm not sure if they're called, I guess it's a provider, uh, server events and configuration management. So configuration management, um, and we'll drill into this a little bit more, but basically handles anything that you do from the SQL Server configuration management. So the service account, uh, the IP, the networking configuration, all that surface area is exposed through their WMI provider. The server events is everything uh, you can subscribe to any kind of events. It supports WQL, so I can say um, whenever this table, whenever a table is created in this database, send me an event. And a SQL Server sets that up. Uh, behind the scenes, there's a, a private version of Service Broker that supports all that. It's a pretty cool uh, technology. It's not used a whole lot from PowerShell. I see the configuration management provider being used more frequently for um, setting up SQL Server. As far as commandlets, I'll just cover a couple of them that are, are kind of frequently used. There's a bunch more and we'll, we'll look at them when we get into the demos. So invoke SQL CMD uh, just executes T-SQL and returns data to PowerShell. It's a replacement for SQL CMD.exe, um, sort of. A lot of people have issues with invoke SQL CMD. Um, the two main issues are the timeout, the inability to set the connection string name, and the, um, the way it handles errors. It's kind of obnoxious sometimes. So a lot of people still 
will call SQL uh, cmd.exe from PowerShell as opposed to using the commandlet. I try to use the commandlet when I can, but I use what works too. So, a uh, couple other things. So, encode SQL name. So, there's difference in rules between um, what's a PowerShell allowable and what's a SQL Server allowable. So, these two uh, encode SQL name and convert UR into path are two util uh, commandlets that you can use to kind of get back and forth between those. It's, it's really unfortunate. We'll talk a little bit more about URNs. They're pretty powerful, but they're kind of neutered in the current implementation. And it's something I hope uh, whoever's responsible for the PowerShell commandlets uh, can fix because it could support some pretty cool uh, filtering scenarios. Any questions so far on command these, support? Uh, yes, sir. Does does the SQL team have a connect or anything that you're able to give this feedback to? That's or? a great question. So the, the question is, does the SQL team have a connect? And as far as I know, they do, but I don't know that if I put something against their PowerShell provider, would it actually get routed to the right people? And since I think they only have like eight people <laughs> working on the entire engine. What's that? I've only seen the connect site for taps for Yeah. Uh, so they, do they have a yeah, they have a pub, a totally public one, yeah, for sure. So you you could log things against there. I've done I've done it a couple times. It's it's kind of like I don't know going out in the parking lot and talking to the tree sometimes, right? But it's it's there. It makes you feel good to to spend in a half hour like documenting this up and telling them how you expect it to work, and then uh, six months later get an email that says closed by design. So, always <laughs> validates my existence. Slide. Yes, sir. The previous slide. Yeah, yeah. Are you going to talk more about the uh, encode and the convert? Yeah, we'll we'll hit that a little bit more about how that works for sure. Um, okay, so the PS provider supports the common navigational commandlets, so get item, child item, working with paths, setting locations, uh, pushing locations, popping locations, all that good stuff. Um, again, to, to use it, you just import the module, SQL PS, and it po points you right to it, and it just allows you to navigate the SQL Server instance like a file system, and it'll handle remote instances. Um, and we'll drop into a demo here in a minute, we'll take a peek at that. Um, so here's some of the command line utilities that I was talking about. Um, you can see we've got some of these you might be familiar with. BCP is another good one uh, for quickly loading data. Instead of like loading stuff into a, a data set and the, or data table and then trying to do line by line inserts, BCP can, can handle a wide variety of files, tab delimited, comma separated, so on and so forth. So it's probably the most efficient way to get data into SQL Server. Uh, table diff, I talked a little bit about that. I've seen some people do some stuff with SSMS.exe. That's the actual um, SQL work bench or management studio. Uh, you can set things up like set up an alias to SMS.exe and pass in file paths and have it open to the right server with the right scripts that you want. DTA is another good one. How many people use DTA to do index analysis on their SQL Server databases? So it can basically take a, a, a trace file or an extended events trace. Uh, or it can take a live server, which I don't recommend doing, and it'll analyze, and you can give it some options. You can say, I want to leave the physical design structures in place, I want to create new ones, I want to recommend table partitioning, primary keys, all that kind of stuff. And then it'll, it'll analyze and say, here's, given your workload, here's what we think you should do. So it's an interesting tool. I've seen this go wrong a lot of times where people just follow the recommendations out of the box, and then you get all these weird, weirdly named indexes that are duplicates. Um, so it doesn't do a lot, a good job a lot of times of figuring out, hey, this is a duplicate index and we probably don't need to create it. But that being said, it can, it can be a good starting point to look at index tuning. Uh, SQL CMD.exe, it's basically just a way to execute Transact SQL uh, from a DOS command prompt. And then setup.exe is the, is the uh, install utility. And there's a whole help section on that that tells you how to, how to script that. Um, and it's totally scriptable from DOS. I find it's it's a little bit better to, to automate it with PowerShell. So. All right, let's actually let's do a quick since we had a question about it. And I'm I'm gonna struggle a little bit because I don't have a lot of space up here. Okay, so. And I've actually got this loaded. So basically, what I did is I uh, imported this module SQL PS with the disable name checking. If I don't, uh, it gives you a warning. I'll just run it again, although it's not going to do anything since I'm already. Um, one of the things to note is it, it automatically, if I was over in the C drive, it's automatically going to put me into SQL Server. Um, so now, 
I can say, okay, what about these 45 commandments that you mentioned earlier, right? And there we go. So you would think with all these commandments, it would actually do something useful. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it turns out there, so their initial approach was basically just to ship pretty much invoke SQL CMD. You had a couple other things that you could do like with the convert and decodes. Um, and that was it. I think at, at one point there were like eight commandlets that shipped. And apparently that meant the management criteria, uh, the common management criteria. I don't think it did, but whatever. Um, and I think their thought was, well, if you can invoke SQL CMD, you can run anything you need to do in the engine. You have access to SMO, so we're done. But it, it's kind of crappy. So what you'll notice, though, the reason I call this out is a lot of the newer features here. So you see a lot of stuff about availability groups, right? And then that's most of the new surface area. So the point is the newer stuff that's coming out as versions uh, continue to march out should have better uh, commandlet coverage. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting, and I'll, I won't go on too much of a uh, sidetrack on this, but I think it's really good, especially for, for people that are like IT administrators and um, kind of reluctant DBAs, is this whole uh, smart admin backup section. And the ability of SQL Server to do, start doing a lot of hybrid stuff with Azure. So I can um, set up smart admin to automatically um, push my backups to the cloud, for example, to Azure, which is pretty cool. And it just works, right? It, I set up the cadence and it does it, pushes it out. Now you've got to have the firewall open, you've got to get all that set up, but uh, it's a pretty good option there. Um, the other thing you can do is uh, you can do that all manually on your own. You can set up, um, it can mount blobs natively in 2014. So I can set my file groups up there, I can set my log files up there, my temp files. And you probably say, well, gee, that sounds like a really bad idea from a performance standpoint, right? So maybe. So there's two key scenarios for that. So if you really have a smaller database workload, right, it'll, it's only going to hit that data file when it reads the data in. So if all your data can fit into memory, okay, it's probably not going to kill those performance as bad as you think it would to do that. The other thing is with Azure VMs, there's a limit of eight LUNs you can attach to the largest VM. So with SQL Server, you typically want to throw more LUNs at it, and that's a way to get around that because you can use those blobs, and I could, I could mount, for example, eight different blobs to my temp DB. I can have one per file up to, to eight, and then I can save those other ones for things that are more performance critical, like uh, save my log file drive, right? So I could use storage spaces, or I could just use um, Windows volume striping. Um, so I definitely encourage you guys, uh, just kind of a little bit of a rabbit hole, but look at some of the hybrid cloud stuff that they're starting to ship with SQL Server. Um, I think they're pretty pretty powerful. So most of this stuff here is either related to the smart backups or setting always on availability groups. And I'll be honest, I haven't done a whole lot with the, with the always on uh, commandlets. I've heard there's some limitations there. What's uh, this, yeah. the smart uh, SQL do? So, so that basically says it's kind of, I, I guess I call it policy-based backups. So you define a policy and then it backs it up automatically to the cloud for you on a certain cadence. Okay. Yeah. So that's the Azure feature? Yeah, that's, that's part of it. Okay. And I'm not sure, honestly, if they have a, uh, an on-prem. Anyway, you see here when I get, uh, I'll make that a little bit bigger for you guys, I guess. Um, when I get into this SQL Server drive, I've got all this stuff. Um, there's an SSIS provider here, right? There's SQL, which is where we're about to go. And there's some other stuff here. There's analysis services, X, X events, data collection. Um, so there's a lot of different stuff. But pretty much where you want to be is SQL. And then I can CD, and my laptop name is my last name. So I can go to there. And I always never remember how to spell default. And I shouldn't be typing since it's not yet 11 not legal to type until afternoon. Um, but here we go. So this is this is where you're going to spend a lot of your time uh, in the provider. Oop, sorry about that. See, that's why I don't type. Um, you can see here I have access to my database mail, uh, my job server, my databases, um, backup devices if I had them. So I've got server level constructs here and then I can start going into the, uh, the database level stuff as well. So do this, I can see, yeah. yeah, whatever. It's not case sensitive, I hope. Uh, I can do dir. Now, so you can see I can treat this just like a just like a file system pretty much. 
I get some statuses back here. So I'm actually getting SMO objects back. So this is actually a, a SQL Server Management SMO.database object. Um, one thing you don't see here is you don't see tempdb or any of those things. So does anybody know how I might be able to see those? Like think about what you know about a get child item. He's the force, Use right? the force. Yeah. Does, it, does this work? I've never even tried. That's awesome. Isn't that crazy? That's cool. Yeah, so if you use force, it should. Yeah, there's my master database. Yeah, so they're all there, right? So that's kind of something to keep, kind of keep in mind. Um, and in a nutshell, I can just keep drilling down in. So into the databases, I can go into tables, I can go into indexes from there, I can go into the columns, uh, so on and so forth. So that's just a real quick high level um, overview. If there's things you guys want me to, to kind of muddle through, we can, we can do that as well. Um, and I've got more demos, so. Do you find yourself using InVoke uh, SQL the most? I mean. So this is interesting. Um, I'm kind of a little bit of a, uh, I guess I'd say I'm dog dogmatic, right? Like I, I think that there's a right way to do things and then there's a way you do it. Right. <laughs> and so, which is bad because it's, it's not a, it's, it's, it's a habit I'm trying to break. But in general, when I use PowerShell, I look to try to do SMO first even if it's more work, because I guarantee it is, right? But to me, there's less, once I get that right, I guarantee that as versions progress and as that SQL changes, um, the SMO will continue to work, assuming there's no breaking changes to the API. Um, so if I, so here's an example, and I have a demo of this later where I, uh, I believe I create alerts or operators or something like that. I could totally do that in T-SQL, right? I don't have IntelliSense, so I can't even, I'd have to know like, okay, how do I create an operator with T-SQL? Does anybody know? I think it's like SP underscore add operator, right? So how would I do it in SMO? It's, it's pretty easy, right? I can think about the, a, the API of what I know about it, and I know I need to go in the job server, find the operator's collection, and add a new operator. To me, that makes a lot more sense. It's a little bit more verbose, right? Because there's all this object-oriented cruft I've got to do, and I've got to construct objects and whatever. But um, that's why I wish they'd really bulk out this API a little bit better so that I could just call, uh, you know, uh, create operator or whatever the right command lit naming is. I'm not sure if that's it's create, create's okay. New, maybe new operator, how about that? Anyway. So, uh, in, you mentioned in the provider that you get back SMO objects. Mm -hmm. are, there, are, are there any gaps between the provider and then loading the SMO assemblies yourself or? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. In general, I believe the provider loads everything. There may be a few uh, kind of ancillary assemblies that are kind of tangentially related like RMO and stuff like that, uh, where replication management objects that don't <coughs> get loaded by default, but you can always add those in after the fact, right? Yeah. I, I guess meant, are there scenarios that you don't see exposed in the, in the provider that you would handle if you went and If you did it yourself? Yeah. Yeah, not really. I mean, so it's going to load all this stuff and you're going to be able to navigate through that tree. And what's interesting is I can just, I can create that server is kind of the root object in SMO. And what I can do is when I'm at the server level in the provider, I can do get item dot and dump that to a variable and it's a server object. So once I have that server hook, I can go do anything I want through SMO, right? As long as I have that context set. Yeah. So it's a great question though. So does that help some of that object oriented gunk that you're talking about? Like, could you go to the operators node in the provider and then just do dot add. Yeah, so that's a really good point. It, it does help that a little bit. I mean, you've got to do a new, you've got to still do a new object, right? So it's not, it, I don't believe it supports like, um, yeah, like new item and stuff like that. So it's not that smart. Um, but it, you, it helps you, mainly it helps you navigate to the right place. And then the thing of it is, is the four horsemen, right? Get command link, get help, um, get alias, all those metadata discovery stuff. Uh, get member is really helpful there because then I can look at there, get the members, figure it out. And the, the nice thing I like about get members, the very first thing it outputs is the type name. Yeah. And if I, go, if I Google that type name or bingle it or whatever I want to do with it, um, it usually leads me right to the MSDN thing, which I actually put this really sweet thing on Connect a couple nights ago that there should be a, a get help dash MSDN and then the topic name of the article, just like you can do get help minus online. I think they should do that, but I don't know. None of my stuff ever gets votes. So. <laughs> anyway. Um, so the point of this slide, and I apologize, it's kind of 
kind of interesting, is just to show you that there's all these files. Um, they get loaded, like I said, as part of the import module, but if you need to do it yourself, some of these are kind of counterintuitive, and the namespaces don't completely match up. So most of your namespaces start off of SMO, but you can see the assembly names here. And this is for the people that are doing things uh, kind of the, uh, the old school load assembly way. I don't think, I think there's an issue where you can't, you can fully qualify the assembly name with the, um, oh, what do they call that, the, the GUID or whatever. But you can't just say, I can't just say the assembly name, I can't just say add type microsoft.sqlserver.smo, it'll give you an error. Um, this is important. This is where this stuff is installed. If you don't have a server, but you still want that small provider, there's um, there's a feature pack that you can download that has the, the PowerShell provider, and you also need the SQL CLR types. And you can load those on your client machine. So if you had like an admin workstation you wanted to run um, or anything like that, you could you could get this without installing SQL Server proper. So if you install SSMS, you get all that? Yeah, actually it's, um, oh, let me, hang on. Let me peek at the notes, because I, Thought I had a thought I put a note on that. I guess I didn't. Um, there's a, it's a specific feature inside the SQL in, in the install node, and I want to say it's it's client client API or client tools or something like that. But that gets you that gets you what you need there. Uh, all right. Uh, again, and, and so this is not, everybody knows that namespaces aren't assemblies, right? So these are the actual namespaces. If I was going to load these namespaces with load with partial, um, it tells you kind of the surface area. In general, you typically grab SMO, common, uh, maybe agent. Some of these other ones, like broker, I probably wouldn't load that if I needed it, didn't need it. Registered servers, I wouldn't mess with that. SMO, WMI. There's two ways to do WMI. Um, one is through SMO, and the other is through SIM or uh, WMI, the uh, normal commandlets. But you can also, they also make it a little easier to work with through here. I don't tend to use this that much, um, but that's just me being a purist, I guess. So, of course, you guys can all read that, right? Um, so this is, memory. yeah, it committed to memory. This is the, uh, the footprint of, so it's four pages, right? And it just shows you the whole hierarchy. So here I've got server, which is my root object, database. I can keep drilling down into that. And I stole this from MSDN. I, I wish they'd make a, a better picture of this. Maybe I'll make like a little cheat sheet someday if I ever get some free time. But it just shows you, I mean, there's a huge surface area here to learn, right? And some of these things have some really weird idiosyncrasies. Most of them are pretty straightforward. Um, sometimes you have to create the child object and then give it the context of the parent so that it actually um, makes a server change for you. Connection management. So. With SMO, I, I usually instantiate a server object or I can get it from my PS provider path. Um, I can either uh, use a default parameter list constructor and set the properties. So I can say I can create a server object and then set the server name to you know, foo and it'll connect to it. There's no need to explicitly call connect or disconnect, although that's available to you if you want. One scenario is if you, if you want to explicitly call uh, disconnect, the connection gets released back to the connection pool probably not going to run into any scenarios around that causing problems, but um, sometimes you want to clean stuff up. So working with the objects, you've got a couple options. Um, you can call methods, so things like create, alter, refresh. Um, usually they can take parameters, return data types. Um, sometimes they return a complex structure, you know, like a, a column or a, a other things. So you kind of have to be ready to handle that output. Uh, you can set and get properties, so a lot of the, like when I go to the table level, there's going to be properties there that I can get a set, and there's also a properties collection, too, um, that I can enumerate through and get all the properties that are at the table level. So some of them are exposed as first level properties, others of them are only available by enumerating that collection. And you might hear me say enumerate. Uh, there's, there's things where I can say, like, enumerate something on this object, and it's just a way of getting a data table back that's freeform that has other information that SQL Server tracks from a metadata standpoint. Um, some of the objects like tables and so on and so forth take data types, so you actually create a data type object. Um, an example would be a data type of varcar100. That's not nullable, that I would then assign that data type to a column, and assign that column to a table and create it, right? Transactions, we're not gonna talk a whole lot about that, but I can um, start working with the server and doing th do things in transactional nature and then either roll it back or commit it, which can be interesting. The general pattern to get familiar with 
since you don't want to memorize that whole thing, is there'll be a parent object, such as a table. Then you'll have, a, underneath the table, you have a column collection, right? And then that's going to be a property. And then underneath that, each item will have a column item in it, right? And you'll see that it's really consistent with how they do that. So if you kind of memorize that pattern, and then I'll actually show you guys here on this next slide. Um, these are some of the common methods that you see. So alter, obviously alter is an existing object. Create creates a new one. I can copy one. Some objects support rename. So it turns out these are all interfaces in .NET terms. So you can figure out if, a, if an object is going to support this method by just going up to the help and looking at which interfaces it implements. Um, refresh is a good one. So SMO does some caching behind the scenes. So if you make a change and then you go to list that object, you may not see the new object in your session. You can always call refresh to force a server sync. And then script, which is really cool. So anything that I can create from SMO, I can script it out. Okay. So you had asked earlier about the URNs. Um, it's basically a way to, to shortcut address something in SQL Server. So here's an example where I'm going to see a server database. It's kind of an XPath-like query, if anybody's ever done anything like that. Um, I'm saying AdventureWorks 2012, so that'll give me back a single database. What's cool and what the provider, you would hope that the provider would support this, right? So I should be able to do set location and pass, pass in a URN, but you can't, which really sucks. Because the other thing I could do is I could, here I could wildcard this and say, give me all the tables for, for all databases that don't have a primary key. And I could craft that as a small expression, or sorry, as a URN expression, and I should be able to get a collection back. And you can't do that. There is an object, or there is a method off the server object called get small object that takes a path. So if I, if I have a list of URNs, I can go one by one and get the objects back for those. And then the scripter object uses it pretty heavily, which we'll talk more about that. So every class instance is going to have a URN. So a table is going to have a URN. Uh, an operator will have a URN. And it's just a shortcut to navigate to there. But they're all these explicit URNs. They're not, so there's some capability here to support wildcarding. But you can't do that with um, with this get small object method. It's still a good method to be used uh, to know about. And then if I have a URN, I can convert that to the, the provider path, and it'll actually tell me here's where it is, right? Well, but, I mean, it's there, but do you use it? So <laughs> it's a, it's a good question, right? It's yeah. There's probably some scenarios where. If I'm writing some script, and it might just be easier for me if I have the object, I'll just get a small path. I'll convert it to the provider path and go that way. Sometimes it's the other way is maybe I have the provider path and um, maybe I don't want to use the PS provider. Maybe I want to do, uh, maybe I have a session hanging out that's remote on the other server and I want to just load the, the SMO assemblies and, and use the URN path that way. But yeah, it's not something that you have to really frequently understand. It can be helpful in certain scenarios, right? Um, more so, I would say, in CoGen, probably. Um, so let's. So some of those um, expressions that you are comfortable with, mm -hmm. have you ever tried them with using the provider like dir recurse, where it has primary keys, false, that kind of stuff? Have you tried that? Yeah, and it, I didn't get it to work. Was your experience oh. different? Yeah, so it would be nice, right? If that would, because that's how I'd expect it to work. That that's the thing is, PowerShell sets you up for a lot of frustration because it's they think of everything, right? I mean, a, a good, you know, you, and I don't know if people have worked with like Exchange or there's other object models that are more robust, right? And and PowerShell, the way it behaves by default is just does really good stuff for you. It's really powerful. And then when you get into something that's not quite completely implemented with the same mentality. And it gets frustrating because you want to just be able to do that, right? I'd, I'd love to be able to go get child item and, and pass in aware or use or minus filter would even be better, right? Minus filter. So, but no, yeah, no love. Um, let's, let's look at some more demos real quick. Um, so, I'll tell you what, let's look at this backup and restore. I kind of I kind of skipped over it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and set my location. So I've already imported the PS provider, hopefully. I've got my location. I'm back up at default. And then I'm going to do just exactly what you just said. I'm going to get child item. Uh, and actually, I need to be, I believe, let's see if this works. This might not work. Yeah. Does anybody know why that doesn't work? 
so where I actually need to be is I need to be in the database collection, right? If you did a dash rehearse on that get child item. Yeah, let's try it. There's a couple different ways I could probably solve that, but let's see. Ooh, how about, there we go. I'm not sure, to be honest, if that's going to work. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Recurse would navigate through all the all the subfolders, and I, I know why that's not supported, right? Because you could, if you recursed everything, you could end up with different objects coming back, and I think that's one of the limitations is it only wants to work with one type of object in a in a collection. So when you see the two databases, it's only going to return you that database. Yeah. So uh, let's see here. Where am I at? Uh, let's not do that. Let's do. Man, what's up with caps locks? All right. There we go. All okay. right. So what I did is then I, I filtered this. Uh, you know, I could probably do this a little bit more efficiently if I wanted to, but I just want to find any of the databases that have adventure in their names because that's I'm feeling kind of adventurous today. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and back up, and I'm just going to take a database backup. So this is a really simple use case, um, but just to show you how how robust that is, right? I mean, right there. I could easily go through and back up all of the databases on the instance. Now, do you want to do that? Probably not, especially if you have larger databases. But I will say, has, does everybody know about show command? Show command is awesome. So the nice thing about this commandlet is the T-SQL backup has a whole boatload of different options. You know, you can do things like performance tuning uh, by saying the block size and the number of threads, um, buffers, so on and so forth specify the location either to a device or a, a file, um, create a description for a backup set. So all those things are all supported through here. So you can create a pretty robust um, backup command. Um, and I think the nice thing about this is it's all discoverable, right? Whereas if I go to, if I go, and I don't have internet access, but here's the link to the back T-SQL backup command, there's probably not a whole lot of people, why is that still running? Uh, there's probably not a whole lot of people that know the backup command syntax, like to be able to do anything. But with PowerShell, I've got syntax help, right? So that's, that's why I like PowerShell. Um, all right, so, or I could do it this way, right? If I had a hook to uh, a, a collection of databases called dollar sign database, I could manually loop through this. Um, and just to show you here that I can pass in parameters to it, right, whatever. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and I, I think this might already exist. We'll see what happens. Okay, so now I've got a backup drive, right? I like this technique. This is a really good thing to do, is to set up these little, I call them little cheroots, but it's basically a PS drive that kind of shortcuts some path in here. Because one of the things you'll see is that file system path can get pretty gnarly, right, in terms of depth. But also with your PS provider, I'll set up a, I'll set up a, uh, a PS drive to, like if I'm on Horner Instance, for example, I'll set up a PS drive to uh, SQL, Horner, Default, and map that there so I can just go CD Horner and I'm right there, right? So I like to set up these little PS drives. Uh, I might set one up for my log file drives. I might set one up for my error file drives. Uh, and I might set one up for my data drives. You know, so I have instant access to any of these drives. So again, all kind of basic, um, basic stuff. Now I created a function called a read SQL backup header here. Um, one of the things that you want to do is, taking backups are great, right? But it doesn't matter if I take a backup if I don't restore it, right? And there's there's two good things that every IT professional or every DBA should have: a good backup or a good resume. Right? You need one or the other. Okay. So, but what I'm showing you here is there's a there's a, a thing called um, uh, what is it? Restore header only that I would do to check a database backup. Now it doesn't actually say is it good, but it tries to read the header, tells you what backup set is in there, right? What media is in there. So it's a way because oftentimes you might have a, um, let's see here, if I do, so if I do, uh, so, and does everybody know about, uh, let's see, push location. Um, let's see here, what did, I, what did I call that? I called that backup, didn't I? Does everybody know about the goodness of push location, pop location? Yeah, so anytime you write a script and you're gonna change context, I've got an example of this later where I wanna change the path for some reason. I always recommend push that location. What it does is it stores it in a, in a was it first in, first in, first out buffer or whatever, so that 
Um, if I want to get back to this directory and I don't know where it was, I can just pop it at the end of my script and go back to where the user is. Because you don't want to write these Wizards of Oz scripts, right? Where you take somebody to a land far away and they can never get back to where they were. Um, so, anyway. It's also great when you have to import the SQL Server module. Yes, because then you can get back to where you were. That's one of the obnoxious things that it does, right? It takes you to SQL Server by default. All right, so I'm going to do a DIR there. And you can see I've got all these files, right? But if I had a, if I needed to know which one of these to restore, I mean, I can kind of know, right? But am I sure it's the right one? And I can do it through the GUI, but I'm just going to go through. I'm going to, I'm going to dump out the headers, and I'll, I'll show you guys this, this function a little bit later, right? But, oh, and how about we run the demo so that we have the code that we need? All right. So it's pretty simple. But this is a case where, and this is a garbage function, right? I, I could have made it a lot more robust, a lot more fault tolerant, but I didn't. Um, I'm basically going to go in here, I'm going to add a device, and I'm going to read backup header. And there's no error handling here, and I'm just going to return uh, a data table out to the pipeline, or to the, the output. So I'm going to go in and run this. How are we doing on time, by the way? And you, OK, so almost done. You can see it threw up on something, which is kind of interesting. Um, but you can see all this information I get, so it tells me, um, you know, is it damaged, is it good? Th these things become interesting recovery forks. Uh, what version is it? The LSN, the first LSN, the last LSN. So that tells you what point in time the database is consistent to. Uh, when did it start? When did it finish? So on and so forth. But you saw, if you caught it, you saw some blood on my screen, right? <laughs> um, so I'm going to just shortcut since we're running a wee bit behind. And uh, I'm going to tell you, was this backup later, right? So I'm going to read it just to prove that it's errored. OK, so that's bad. So that's why this function is important. Um, it threw an exception. And I'm just, for curiosity, I'm going to go in there, because I've got admins that have a bad habit of, of like storing media files in the backup directory, because there's a lot of storage space there. So I'm going to read this magic number. Oh, look, it's not a SQL Server backup file. It's some kind of a, a multimedia file. So what I'm going to do. Guy. And does the read cycle be SQL backup header, does it do the checksum verification too, or does it just extract out the front bits? Like, do you know if it's a good backup by doing that? I, if it can read the header, I think it's probably good. I'm not I'm completely sure, to be honest with you. I think it does, because I think I saw that checksum field in there. Unless you have database corruption in your database. Yeah, so obviously as you restore the database, things could go bad. It hopefully, like I said, if you've got the right options, that it works. And depending on what data is corrupt, like <coughs> you're uh, doing the geodata or the, uh, the, 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 the types, not all of the, not all of the database validation. So, so basically, it tells you is a media okay, but not necessarily is the contents of the backup good. You could still get a failure, right? So, with any luck, and that's why I needed the audio. So, so it's just kind of interesting because we got rolled. Yeah. So you never know, right? What might be in these backup files. So the point, the point, the takeaway is to always check those backups after you take them and, and make sure that they're good before you just blindly try to restore them. And of course, there's a restore database command that you could do. Um, another connect item I put in the other night while I was writing this, because I stole this function. I think this function actually originated out of the, the PowerShell in Action book. Um, I extended it because the, the magic header that they were, or the magic number they were trying to pull out of the file wasn't robust enough. I needed to go out to 24 bits. Um, I think this should be built into PowerShell. This has some really good forensics uses, I think, to be able to sniff the file, even though, even though it's not going to be completely correct all the time. I think it would be useful to have that built in, but we'll see if anybody agrees. Um, let's just real quick. I think people do agree. You, people do agree? Good. Yeah. All right. Um, so this is just showing doing it the old school way. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. We want to do. I think I can do it from here. Let's see if this works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an operator. 
I'm going to go through, and the best practice is set up alerts on errors of severity 19 through 25. Go through here, I'm going to create the alert, and I should, if I have the right context here, there we go. And so, created the alerts, if I go out to here, I can go into SQL Server, I can go into my alerts, and if I call this refresh, what SMO method do you think that calls? So that calls refresh. There's all my alerts, right? So I could use that. I could I could do a PowerShell uh, workflow and run that across 50 or 60 servers. Um, you know, there's all sorts of other things, like other ways I could do that kind of at scale. Uh, let's see, what else do we want to look at? I can also delete those alerts if I wanted to here using the provider path. I can get them, to get all the alerts. Oh. Ah, interesting. I created a PS drive up here. Here's a kind of a way I kind of wrap some error checking checking around it and said if it exists, um, create it. So that's kind of cool, right? Um, what if I want to check out some indexes? So let's assume that um, I want to look at the fragmentation of all the indexes in a certain database. I can go through here, and this is all using SMO, so I'm going to get SMO server, and I'm just going to call this enum fragmentation method. We can run it. I think I'm almost out of time, huh? Yeah, all right. So you can see here what I could do is if it was uh, less than 30%, I could rebuild it. Uh, I could reorganize it. If it was greater than 30%, I could, I could reorg it. I want to show scripting. So anybody ever work with any developers that are kind of knuckle dragging and haven't discovered version control yet? So you might want to go into your development database and script out all the sprocks, right? And dump them out. So this is how you can use the SMO scripter object. And I can put some options on it here. Um, now I, I do a what if, because I don't want to actually write it out. Or I just don't run the demo. Oh, that's awesome. Did I not, do I have context in here? I think so. Uh, that's weird, that should work. Okay. All right. Well, that's it. I've got the slides. Um, there's more stuff that we didn't quite have time to get through. I uh, apologize for that. The one thing I will say, uh, just real quick, I have some pretty extensive links and books and some other stuff here that I think is really useful. Um, this is all stuff that's, for the most part, free. Um, there's a lot of great books out there. And uh, thanks. I hope that it was useful for everybody. Thank you.